So welcome everyone. We appreciate uh, everyone joining us today for the Conquering the CMMC Mountain, Lessons Learned in Implementing Cybersecurity Measures with our featured uh, speaker here today, Brian Van Brunt. So just some introductions and housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Aaron Troshnitz. I'm the general manager for North America Small, uh, Smithers Quality Assessments Division. You will notice as we go through this webinar session that the chat has been disabled. So if you have any feedback, any questions, we will be capturing those throughout the session. We'd ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom and that will be monitored for any kind of Q&A at the conclusion of the presentation. After you exit the webinar, there will be a brief survey. As always, we appreciate any feedback that can be provided. So our presenter today, Mr. Brian Van Brunt, is the VP Legal and Regulatory Compliance at VTMB LLC. Brian is a Florida-based attorney specializing in government contracts who started his career nearly 20 years ago as part of the US Air Force as a JAG attorney. He's most recently been working uh, at a large defense contractor's uh, director of contracts and deputy general counsel of a large business unit. Uh, Brian is also the founder of Van Brunt Law Firm, a government contracts and business law firm based out of Tampa, the co-owner of VTMB, uh, a defense contracting consulting company and serves as a fractional COO and general counsel to uh, medium-sized defense firms in Florida. Brian himself has led several uh, companies in implementing cybersecurity measures to comply with CMMC, and he has been involved in the business side of the project as a program manager, evaluating different technology options, policies, procedures, and providing training to companies of various sizes. So with that, Brian, I will turn it over to you. Okay. All right, let me share, share my screen here and get started. All right. Well, all right, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that introduction very much. And, um, and thank you all for, those of you who are uh, watching and listening, uh, I think I'd like to start off by uh, talking about what, who this is really for, who is this presentation really for? Because this is, this is kind of a different presentation on CMMC than you, you might've already had. Uh, CMMC has been around now for gosh, 18 months or so and, uh, or longer uh, in various forms, the DFARS clause before that. And, um, and I'm sure you've probably been to webinars or you've heard speakers talk about, you know, what's the next step in CMMC? When is it gonna be implemented? What can we expect in terms of um, the governing bodies coming out with um, their approvals and, and those sorts of things? But this is, this is a little bit different of a presentation. Um, I thought it would be helpful uh, to industry to have a conversation about how do you run a CMMC implementation project? Because it can be absolutely overwhelming um, if it's not approached in the right way. CMMC and cybersecurity is relatively a, a new animal for a lot, of, uh, a lot of defense firms. And the project itself is, you know, what is involved, understanding what is involved, who should be involved in the project, how it should be uh, managed uh, to avoid the pitfalls and then talk about what some of those pitfalls are and some of those lessons learned. Um, hopefully going through this uh, short presentation today, you'll learn some things that will save your project some time and money uh, on the back end. Um, so first of all, let's talk about getting past that overwhelmed feeling. Uh, I get it. I am a lawyer by trade, and I did not start uh, doing cybersecurity or CMMC uh, until not that long ago. And it was always that foreign concept to me. It was, well, that's the IT department's issue, or um, the CISO has that, has that uh, handled. I'm a user uh, of the equipment. So um, that stuff was, was just kind of foreign to me. But um, and it took me out of my comfort zone. However, 
I had responsibilities as a lawyer to companies to help them comply because at the same time, there is there are these technical requirements. At the end of the day, this is a compliance program. So uh, I got involved. Um, and, and so getting into the right frame of mind, how can, how can you, uh, either as a company owner or someone within your company who's got responsibilities for this project, how can you get company ownership to be comfortable um, with the whole idea of cybersecurity and this project going forward. And, and I think really the best way to do that is there's a lot of familiarity in industry with ISO certifications, where you're getting certified at, that you are proficient at certain processes and procedures, that you follow your processes and procedures, uh, and those processes and procedures produce a predictable result. That is essentially what CMMC is. Um, it's got a different name, but at the end of the day, you are putting in processes, procedures, and technology, training your people to achieve a predictable, uh, a somewhat predictable result, um, and that is to protect data. CMMC has its own requirements, and you also want to pass an audit, but at the end of the day, you're trying to get this certification that shows you are protecting your data. So think about it in terms of a, um, very much akin to ISO certification. It's a creation of controls that have to be maintained. You're having third-party audits and certifications that uh, come in, no different than an ISO certification. And just like ISO certifications are uh, in, many, in manufacturing and some other areas of DOD, it's required, it's a, it's a cost of entry to do business with the Department of Defense uh, going forward. So. Um, the, the expense is not a wasted investment. It is certainly something that is worth it if you want to work in, in the, uh, the DOD space. So getting the right uh, mindset will help you get past the overwhelmed part. Secondly, um, don't go it alone. Um, even if you are a, a cybersecurity person or an IT firm, uh, this is complicated stuff and it's not, it doesn't fit squarely within one aspect of information technology or even cybersecurity. There are very, there are varying um, disciplines within it. And like, for example, I'm a lawyer um, and I practice government contracts law. I get family members and friends who think, okay, you're a lawyer, I'm going to ask you a question. And it has nothing to do with my the things I've been doing for the, over 20 years. They might ask me a question about uh, personal injury law or uh, a family law issue, and I'm not equipped to handle those things. I'm not well-versed in them. I don't have experience doing those things. And so think of that in terms of when this CMMC project, um, yes, it's about cybersecurity, but it also involves specialties within cybersecurity. For example, things like cloud security, um, Microsoft tools and uh, Microsoft Azure specialties and um, the, um, the controls that go behind MDM within Microsoft. And as I, one of the lessons that I've learned through going through this is nobody is an expert in all of those things. Um, there are experts in individual pieces of those things and you will do yourself a favor by finding the people who, like, for example, someone who's an expert in Microsoft Azure or um, cloud app security or um, the hardware that goes into meeting the FIPS uh, encryption standards for your Wi-Fi and all those sort of things. Don't try to go this alone. You know, my first bullet on there, if you're an electric, if you aren't an electrician, don't mess with wires. Uh, you'll save yourself a lot of cost and headache if you start with the right people, which is a group of people up front. Um, secondly, I would recommend that you, you not hire a quote unquote IT firm. This is cybersecurity, which is a different discipline. I would recommend lesson learned, you know, from some of the projects that I've been working on, hire a cybersecurity firm. Um, check experience with cybersecurity. And, and what I mean, not just like, do, have they been in cybersecurity for a while, but do they understand and do, do they know um, the 
uh, standards that have to be met. Do they have experience with at least the NIST 800-171 standard? Do they have experience with the old DFARS, well, the current DFARS clause, the DASH uh, 7012 clause? What is their experience in trying to meet the CMMC, whatever it is, level three that you're going after um, implementations? Um, how many have they done? Uh, and trust me, you're not gonna find a lot of people who are super experienced in implementing CMMC, it's too new. You'll get a lot of folks who will tell you they have a ton of experience. Um, you look for honesty, okay? Um, third, describe your architecture um, and ask them, you know, generally, what do they think? Just get their thoughts up front, talk about their architecture, that being, you know, we're half cloud-based, half, um server based uh at our site uh whatever it is that you've got describe your system to them um and then the last bullet on here i cannot stress this enough um this is a program um trying to meet cmmc standards or Im implementing a, a cybersecurity uh set of standards uh, controls is a program in and of itself and having an experienced program manager treat it like a program will save you cost, it will save you time, um, and you'll have a much more successful implementation. Uh, and it, it, it will just go much more organized. And you'll see this as a general theme throughout this presentation. Highly recommend do not dump this program or this requirement on your IT department and say, hey, go make a CMMC compliant. As you'll see as we go through that, it, they're, it, it's, they're not equipped. Um, they are equipped to do cybersecurity things, but everything that gets implemented, you're, you're gonna put controls in this, uh, in, into your business and things that will affect how business is accomplished. Um, if you just let your IT firm go do it um, without, business direction and programmatic direction, your business will end up suffering because it wasn't designed for business. It was designed solely for meeting certain requirements that the government has placed on you. Um, okay, La uh, secondly, um, understanding the costs before you begin. Let's talk about what cost categories are out there and what should be considered um, from the program management standpoint, when you move forward, there are the obvious costs. You know, there's hardware and software changes that you will have to make, uh, and they are not cheap. For example, on the hardware side, um, one of the things as you dig deep into these um, regulations, you'll find that there it'll say you have to have encryption. Um, for example, in in your Wi-Fi. Well, the more you dig down, it'll tell you what level of encryption you have to meet. And so you might find out that your uh, your network doesn't meet what's the FIPS 140-2 standard, which is changed into three later this year. Um, you might find that you need to buy new hardware. Um, so that will cost you money and that won't, that's not cheap. Um, you might need to make software changes. You know, most of the folks that I uh, have helped are using a Microsoft based um, set of tools and increasing licenses, whether you have E3s or E5s, increasing to what you need to get the right controls over each one of those devices, those things are gonna cost extra money. But there are other software pieces as well that um, as you're designing it, you may not have anticipated upfront. That's why this is a program that needs a program manager. I can give you an example. So. Um, one of the requirements is uh, in CMMC is to um, be able to protect certain kind of data and label it um, and put um, retention policies on certain kind of data. So that requires different types of tools and Microsoft have some tools, other companies have tools, but whatever works best with your system isn't necessarily what you already have. So uh, you may need to go out and shop different things, shop, uh, shop a tool to, uh, to do labeling, to do record retention, those sorts of things. You may have something that you've already paid for that does meet the requirements and that, that's good, um, but you might not. So 
as you go along, you're going to find that there are additional software requirements that maybe you haven't anticipated. Um, the, and of course, there's the labor for the cyber firm, the cybersecurity firm. Um, that's NRE, non-recurring expense. Um, and then you have recurring expenses. You have the ongoing license fees for software. Um, if you uh, have to hire new personnel like a CISO or new team members to man all of this stuff, and you will, um, then that's a, a recurring cost as well. So understanding what those costs are up front is, uh, will help you prepare a budget that you can work to for your program manager. Um, ask for estimates up front, yes, from uh, whoever you go get quotes from to be your cyber firm to help implement things. Um, but also think about this like a home renovation. And this is an easy, an easy uh, analogy for me because I've done a couple of home renovations and you know, you might have an, a, a budget in mind. We're gonna do this home renovation for $50,000 not true you know you're always going to do it for fifty thousand plus twenty percent or whatever it is that's really the same uh aspect here and the reason for that is much like a home renovation when you go in and you you're pulling wall board down or you're removing the light fixtures you find things behind the walls that oh this doesn't work or that doesn't work or we need to upgrade this because it didn't have it's non compatible with something else that we're doing. For example, you might need to upgrade all of your printers because they're not compatible with um, the new Wi Fi that you're putting in or the two factor authentication that you're putting in. But you don't know that until you start looking at all your peripherals. So be prepared for a budget and treat it like a home renovation and understand that it's going to fluctuate. Now, I also say at the end uh, of this page here that. Um, in the DOD space, we have different types of costs. And one, um, some are allowable and some are unallowable. Um, the, the costs to comply with CMMC are allowable indirect costs if it's going to apply to your whole DOD business line or if it's allocable only to one contract to that contract. So uh, understand that your um, your CFO or your finance team needs to be involved here, not only to track costs or to help budget, but to allocate those costs to your defense business so it can uh, be accounted for. Okay, so that's getting past the overwhelmed, getting your arms around the costs, um, the right set of uh, the right mindset. It's a program. It's a um, it's like an ISO. And it's necessary to enter the DOD business world. Let's talk a little bit about managing the project itself. Okay, like I've said already, this is a multidisciplinary effort. Um, it is not simply an IT exercise and it cannot be, or it won't be successful. Uh, I recommend that again, that you have a dedicated pro program manager who is not uh, the leader of your IT department. The reason I say that is um, the decisions that need to be made along the way, again, they are business decisions and everything that's going to be, every dollar that's going to be spent and every change that's going to be made to the system is going to impact how business is accomplished. So having a program manager with decision-making authority to spend money um, and to choose between products uh, educated by their IT department and their cybersecurity firms that are helping out um, will help your project go along quicker. Don't put your IT department uh, lead in the position of having, having to research uh, op options and then waiting on a decision to be made and then going to somebody who has not been involved in the process does not understand how everything connects to each other um, and then make a decision which may not be the right decision if they had all the information um, and they have to wait on that decision to even be made but if it's made in the context of the program meetings and the program team it'll go quicker it'll go smoother and it'll go uh, much more informed um, obviously your IT department needs to be involved the cybersecurity 
uh, department needs to be involved. Your legal and compliance group, if you have one, should be involved because um, as, as I've done a few of these implementations and we've gone along the way, there are inevitably interpretation questions that come up and um, you have to meet them. And again, this is overall, this is a compliance program, much like ISO certifications. Have someone there who can give you a, an unbiased view of when, I, when I'm reading this uh, control, the description of this control, this is what it means. This is what the words mean. And this is how I would be able to defend it or not defend it. Um, you can also get um, assistance in those kinds of uh, interpretations from some of these firms who have been certified um, to uh, do the audits or do the assessments. Um, but at the end of the day, have your own compliance department in there as well, helping out. One of the, the things that I, um, I ran into on a couple of projects is um, there's different documents. Like, so you'll, uh, the NIST 800-171 standard itself has descriptions of controls that need to be met. Um, and then CMMC has its own descriptions of controls. There is um, there's a manual, an audit, an assessment manual that goes along with CMMC and an assessment manual that goes along with NIST 800-171, which overlap. Those manuals don't necessarily have the same details within them. There's also, like if you're using Microsoft tools, they have templates within them that um, purport to gauge your compliance. Like they'll have this meter on there that says you're 60% compliant with meeting NIST 800-171, um, according to Microsoft, the things that you've turned on. Uh, but then when you go in and read their descriptions, they're different. They're different than the assessment manual that NIST has. They're different than the CMMC manual, assess the assessment manual. And so you have to make a judgment call. At the end of the day, CMMC assessment manuals is what you wanna go with. Um, but reading all of them in concert will help you interpret it. So having your legal and compliance group together is very helpful. Um, HR should be involved because there's a definite human component to this. Uh, this is not just about technology, it's about changing behaviors. And, you, know, you can have all the technology in the world, but if you have some clown who likes to click on every link in their email, it just opens the door to all of your systems regardless of what other kind of protections you have around them. So um, there's gonna be a training component to this that should start early, uh, not after everything gets implemented, but along the way, a training program where you are implementing a new culture at the company of cybersecurity, people, so people understand what, what is CUI, why does it have to be protected? Um, what are the things that open the doors? Um, let them know that they're gonna be monitored um, have them taking the cybersecurity training well before things get implemented uh, and then implement them. So HR needs to be involved uh, up front. There are also um, things that typically might fit within HR or facilities that uh, need to be included because again, there are physical security requirements. So issuing out badges, um, marking of uh, file cabinets in the backs of computers and those sort of things. Those are not IT department types of things. Those are human component types of things. So as you look at people and processes, HR is gonna be involved. Um, and then technology is gonna be the, the cyber group and the IT firm. Um, and finally, finance and accounting. This is not a cheap endeavor. Uh, and it's an investment though. I, I, I don't wanna just say, oh, this is expensive and scare you away from doing this. This is, a, um, this is an investment. It's definitely a worthwhile endeavor. I don't think it, that it's so expensive that it should keep people out of the industry. I just don't, um, having done the ones that I've done, but it will cost a lot more if finance and accounting are not involved up front, helping to budget, um, tracking the budgets, um, predicting the spend going forward. So as things are getting implemented to predict you know, the 12 month spend, the 18 month spend, and then the ongoing um, 
recurring expenses of maintaining the system uh, will help the business uh, add to its overhead or properly account for the costs and keep uh, the, the project as close to budget as possible. Have them involved in, in the program early and often. Okay, um, I also recommend that you have a detailed exchange with your cyber firm. Um, there are certain questions that you should be asking, and this should be an interview. You know, um, you should be talking about what is your architecture? Are you cloud-based? Are you, do you have on-site servers or both? Do you have Macs, Macintoshes, or do you have Windows, or do you have both? Boy, one of the things I um, learned the hard way pretty quickly in a project is, you know, a company had uh, both um, Windows-based machines and Macs, and they do not operate the same, even with Microsoft tools. Um, some tools work on the Windows-based machines and not on the Macs, or they integrate differently. Um, and so it changes the approach. It changes what tools you can use or can't use and what things need to be poems or not. So um, understanding what that looks like. Um, do your employees use company phones or is it bring your own device? And are you using mobile device management or are you using mobile app management? That's a key issue in how are you protecting information on company phones or personal phones uh, and how things get deployed and you know what's being monitored on a phone that a, uh, an employee is using. All of those legal and um, HR type questions come up uh, and they're not easy questions. Uh, you, you, your company likely already has a culture for how those things are being used and this is going to drive some type of change and there's a trade-off there between privacy and um, the need to comply. And so where you end up as a balance on that as a company is gonna, um, is gonna rely on a, a, an important conversation with stakeholders who lie outside of the IT department. Talking about what you use for backup. Um, one of the, the key aspects of uh, CMMC is where do you store um, controlled unclassified information or CUI when it's at rest? Um, and you know there are several options for that. You know there are um, uh, Amazon Gov Cloud based options, and then there's the Microsoft uh, GCC High option and some others. Um, but that's where it's at rest. But you you back you have to back things up too. Well, where are things being backed up to? Where are your emails being backed up to? Your Microsoft Exchange server, the things that you might have in OneDrive uh, or on SharePoint, um, talking about that to make sure that when it's at rest, even in your backup, that it's in a compliant spot. Um, talk about where you have or what types of encryption that you have, not just on the, the device itself, but in your Wi-Fi, uh, in your apps and those sort of things. Um, a, a major point of emphasis is going to be on what type of business that your company is doing. Do you have commercial and government business to consider? Because all of these things that you're going to implement are going to impact um, whatever business falls under your system. So if you have the ability to segregate your commercial business from your government business, um, that might be a business decision that you, you make. Uh, it's hard to do that. I understand that. Um, but if it's not something that's practical and you have to keep them together, um, you need to have a conversation with your cyber firm and other vendors that provide services. Say you have a warehouse inventory system that feeds into your accounting system um, and, and that's connected to all of your stuff. Um, you have to know, well, is this going to still work when I implement my cybersecurity measures that go across all of my operations? Uh, your cyber firm needs to know that and they need to work with those outside vendors for those other applications that you have. Um, do you use things like, like what is your storage? Are you using OneDrive, SharePoint, Dropbox, messaging apps? You can use all of those things, but you have to, you have to know what the universe of those things are 
Um, for example, Dropbox, yeah. Um, are people using their personal Dropbox accounts or are using company Dropbox accounts? And where are those being stored? Are those on Amazon GovCloud where they're protected or are they in something else? And uh, um, is any CUI able to get into those accounts? Those are important things to talk about. Um, what are your current policies and procedures when it comes to cybersecurity? Do you have a current, an existing cybersecurity uh, system security plan, sorry. Um, and, you know, where is your data stored? Basically, you're talking about the, the whole universe of things that are relevant to your cyber firm coming and giving you options and um, technologies to add. But again, it's not just going to be them. It's going to be a whole team of a diverse team of, of people. So they all need to be educated. Um, okay. And again, I'm going to foot stomp this one. Project manage. Um, this again, this cannot be give it to the IT folks and let them run with it. Manage this as a program. Timeliness matters. Have deadlines. Have a project schedule. Um, whether you use Gantt charts or some Microsoft project or whatever it is. Um, at least weekly project team meetings, including vendors when you're talking about certain technology you know bring the vendors into your um, project meetings uh, implementation schedules that um, that are looking at proper sequence you know one, one of the things that I uh, lessons learned was you know there's a there's a dance that has to be accomplished here when you're turning things on in the cybersecurity world you can't just turn on mobile device management and expect it's going to work per um, perfectly. Um, I was managing a project, still am, and um, pushing our guys, let's get this out. This is the most important piece, get mobile device management out. And my cyber guy was like, if you turn this on, this thing over here will turn off. And, and I learned that there is a, a sequence to doing things and presenting that sequence to your key management um, will help them understand what's going to happen when it's going to happen and what's going what they're going to see and experience along the way super important and it'll, it's also super important to make sure that you do it in the right order so that things don't break or the breaking is minimal um, have budgets and budget reviews uh, so that it's you know it's not sticker shock all along the way people understand why things are costing what they cost um, why decisions were made to buy things um, have regular reporting to senior management. Uh, the company owns this program uh, and it's important to continue business and they're held accountable to it. So we need to make sure that senior management is re either regularly included in the meetings, the project meetings, um, and or um, reported to often. Um, inform employees of, of what's coming and why. Uh, you are going to be changing a culture within your company, not just a, a mindset of cybersecurity, that's going to happen, but also how they conduct business every day. Oh, I got to sign in twice. I got to take this training. We get it. Um, now this doesn't work or now that doesn't work. If they understand what's coming, why it's coming and how to use it and they get trained on each new tool prior to it coming out, and then there's a training phase after it's released, it will go much better for you along the way in your organization. It can't, this cannot be done in the background while your employees just work every day on their, on their stuff. And then all of a sudden, poof, stuff, stuff appears or they get an email saying, oh, you're gonna have to start doing this or that. That's not adequate. It, it, won't, it won't go smoothly. Um, be prepared. Um, to terminate vendors who overpromise or who are not the right fit for your architecture. Um, this is, uh, again, this is a new thing for a lot of cyber firms. And, you know, they over, I've run into firms who overpromise not because um, they're just trying to get business. They really believe they can do things, but then they run into some architecture that they haven't run into before. Like, um, they're, let's just say your guys are mostly Windows-based folks, and then they've got a mixed architecture of Windows and Macs, and they're not sure why um, Microsoft uh, device management won't, mobile device management won't work on the Macs the same way. And 
you know, it, there are a lot of things like that that will pop up. Um, and if you need to move on, don't continue to beat your head against the wall. Find somebody who can do it. Uh, and understand it's not, it's not personal. Uh, and in every project, every project is completely different. Uh, and they have unique nuances and there's gonna be learning along the way, no matter who you hire, uh, learning by them, learning by you. You have to be, you have to be patient, but don't, don't continue to beat your head against the wall if a vendor is failing you. Um, that's important. Um, constantly ask questions, you know, what are my options in terms of technology to meet this, to meet this standard? Um, do I have to do it that way is a good question. You're going to hear that a lot from the business side of the team anyways. Are there other ways to meet this um, without having to, you know, interfere with this part of the business? Uh, what are the upfront and recurring costs of the solution you're offering? Um, is that compatible or will it work with our setup, our architecture? Um, make sure they know the answer to that. And if the answer is, I don't know, don't do anything until you do know. Um, or move on to a different option. Um, have you tried it is important to that compatibility question. Um, if they haven't tried it, um, boy, test it. Uh, test it a lot before you um, have it implemented. And, and I just kind of on a on an aside, everything that is happening in the project should be tested in a um, in an environment like the sandbox, quote unquote in an environment that is not um, going to impact the company before you implement it. Ask questions about how are we doing on budget? Um, how will I, sh an, an important question is, you know, this is again, like ISO, you, you can't just say, this is what we're doing. When the auditor comes, you have to show them what you are doing. You have to show them, hey, yes, this is how I'm meeting it. Here's the proof. So when they implement, when you're, implementing something to meet a control, uh, make sure you're asking, what is my proof that this is meeting that control? What can I, what screenshot, what printout, what data can be spit out that, to show that I'm meeting this control? Um, when and how should we train employees on meeting this step? Um, uh, you know, things should not just be rolled out and employees just start working on it have a training schedule and, and work with your uh, IT security firm to know when things are gonna be implemented so that you can prepare that, that schedule. Um, be patient. Uh, again, this is a frustrating endeavor. It's not easy, it can be difficult. This is new to everyone. Nobody is a, no one is an absolute expert with years of experience at meeting CMMC. It just hasn't been around that long. You'll find um, some firms that have done NIST 800-171 for a while, and that's great, super uh, helpful. Um, but be patient, be patient with vendors, be patient internally um, until it's time to cut loose of a vendor. You will have unexpected issues on rollout. You will, uh, every, one, one of the lessons I've learned too is every machine is unique. Every, you know, if you're on laptops, every laptop, um, if they're different brands, different models, they even react to things differently. So be patient when like one laptop is giving you fits. Um, it's going to happen. There's no one size fits all solution. So, you know, this is not, you know, go buy a, a box of software, install it, and all of a sudden you're CMMC compliant. Um, this is, uh, it takes flexibility um, and some creativity to, to meet the requirements, depending on what you've got. Um, and competing interests will need to be resolved by someone with authority. You will have your IT department, your cyber group, um, want it done one way, but your operations group will, uh, could see that as an impediment to them doing business and balk at it, how it, it impacts business. Finance may hate the price tag, but the company may not be able to do business with the DOD if it doesn't comply and, and spend the money. So having that program manager with authority to resolve those disputes um, and, and just make edicts will be very helpful in your project. Um, and, and I also say, 
the why really, really matters in this project. This is not just about um, meeting some, you know, not so important regulation. Um, this is about protecting data from our adversaries and that needs to be continuously preached. Uh, the truth is the, the US is in a literal hot war behind the scenes with adversaries that are actively taking our sensitive data and exploiting it against us. Um, the consequences of that have already been enormous for our national security. And if you're a small business, you know, I, I hear a lot um, from even my own clients, small businesses, and I've had the thought myself that you know, this is gonna put small businesses out of the DOD realm and they should be exempt or whatever. But this isn't about how big or small a company is. It's about what data do they have? Um, because our adversaries, if, you know, if they know the small company has the same data as the big company, because they're a subcontractor on the same, on the same program, uh, but they don't have to have the cybersecurity requirements, guess who they're gonna go attack? They'll just pick the small business. So. Small businesses are not exempt because they have sensitive data. This is all about data. Um, again, this is a good project to protect your own data um, apart from the national security reasons, but keeping in mind and, and keep preaching that will help change the culture, will help people be more vigilant in the things they click on and download and those sort of things. That will also help your program go better and your implementation go better and help get everybody kind of rowing in the same direction as much as possible. Okay, um, that is the end of my set of slides. And I will pause sharing. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Excuse me. That was great. Uh, we did have a, a number of questions that came in uh, during your presentation. So uh, we'll uh, go through those now. So we have a little bit of time yet. Um, and for anybody else who uh, has additional questions, again, there's the little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that to, to ask any other additional questions you may have. But uh, first one, Brian, that came in is, uh, do you have any idea when companies can actually schedule their CMMC audit? Um, roughly, roughly, yeah. So um, there are uh, probably, I would say, be, uh, roughly at the second half of the year that would begin, but there's going to be a priority, okay? The priority is going to be on those contracts who uh, that are going to uh, get a CMMC requirement by the end of the year. And there are, the DOD has wanted to do 15 of those, although that schedule is kind of getting pushed by the end of the year. So if, if a company has one of those 15 contracts, they're gonna get pushed to the front of the line to get their, their audits done. I don't know right now how many um, certified firms there are. Uh, I know it's a handful, um, <clears throat> but I believe by the second half of the year, you should be able to start scheduling those. Um, I would recommend though, that before you schedule an audit, you schedule an assessment uh, with one, a, a firm that can do an assessment to help you um, understand what those holes might be because the audit is not cheap. Um, and I think <laughs> going through it once is way better than going through it twice. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, would a program manager participate in the hiring of a cybersecurity company? Yes, absolutely. Um, but not on his own, obviously, depending on what expertise is, not on his own. Yes, and the reason for that is you want that program manager to understand the entire the entirety of the um, the project, um, who they're hiring, why they're hiring them. Um, it will help. It will help the project um, not just for monetary reasons. Your finance guy is going to keep that that down, but a program manager um, can help pick a firm that's gonna bridge the gap uh, between you know, IT and business and help pick a firm that, is, that fits the, cultural, um, the culture of your company. So I would have the program manager, I'd do that as a team. Uh, have a competition and pick, pick somebody as a team. Great, thank you. 
Uh, next question. I'm assuming working remotely really changes how businesses are handling some aspects of CMMC. Question mark. Oh, that's the question. Yeah. True. Yes. So, um, and to, just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, um, I have a, one of my uh, companies, the VTMB uh, consulting firm, uh, is 100% um, uh, remote. Uh, and so, one of the things that we had to consider because of that is uh, we're all on home-based networks, right? So we have our, 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 in our home internet service provider and you know we all had routers uh, that uh, internet service provider gave us and they don't comply with CMMC requirements. So you know, not only did we on all of our systems have to uh, apply all of the cloud stuff, um, and all of the, the mobile device management and those sort of things, but we had to change out hardware in our homes to meet um, encryption standards uh, so that people couldn't get in. But absolutely, but the CMMC uh, requirement does not go away and it doesn't change whether you're remote, whether you're cloud-based, whether you're server-based, uh, the requirements are the same. So if you have folks working at home, you have to have some, tool set that will allow them to meet the CMMC requirements, whether that's, you know, VPN in or whatever it is uh, to do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, a little bit similar to a previous question, uh, but another one, how long should a company wait to schedule their CMMC audit after they're determined to be ready immediately, or should a company create some length and history of readiness first? So it depends what you mean by determining they're ready. So, if you're de if by determining you're ready, you have tested all of your controls, meaning um, you can go in and print out logs to show, yes, we're monitoring this, or here's all the training everybody had, or here's the screenshots of that. If, if you've got everything that's, you've tested everything and you can prove that you've tested it, then you can probably, you should probably go ahead and schedule it as soon as you can. Um, if you, because, you know, then if you don't, you know, you run the risk of the standard changing. Uh, so I would say, you know, schedule that sooner rather than later. If um, on the other hand, you haven't done those tests and you haven't, you haven't pulled out the proof uh, that you're meeting these, the requirements, don't do it until you, you can audit yourself at least and say, here is my binder full of stuff showing that um, we're actually meeting those controls. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, is CMMC required for a third tier supplier to the government? Yeah, so CMMC is not limited to um, what tier subcontractor you are. It's all database. So um, it's a mandatory flow down from the prime all the way down to the smallest sub. The only exception is um, commercial off the shelf items. So um, for, you know, or you're buying raw material. So when you get to steel, um, you're buying steel ingot, obviously that's that's a commercial purchase at that point. Or if you're buying a commercial off the shelf item, there is a uh, an exception for that. Now there's a caveat to all of that. So what that means is the clause has to be, has to be flowed down. Um, if there's no CUI, okay, um, then there's a, there's a question as to what controls need to be in place and what level of CMMC that uh, sub, sub, sub tier actually needs to meet. Um, and so guidance on that, how you can, how you, um, how the contractor and then the subcontractor and then the next subcontractor decides what level they need to be at. Um, we haven't seen that yet. And we haven't seen, um, okay, Let's just say you're a subcontractor to a prime. The prime contractor is at level three and they're giving you level three information. And so they say level three, but then you're buying things that have uh, from your subcontractors that have a lot less detail. Um, and maybe they're more commercial type items. When, when you're deciding you know, what level they need to meet, that has not been, there's not been good guidance yet on how you have to control uh, your subcontractors or what level they have to be at, especially if they're not getting any CUI. Um, if they're only getting, like for example, if they're not getting a technical drawing, 
you know, they're just being asked to deliver a commercial product. It might not be a COTS item, but a commercial product. Um, there, there's not really good guidance yet. I know they're talking about it and some guidance has been pushed out, but I don't wanna say there's good guidance as to um, what you flow down to that sub sub tier, unfortunately, but TBD. Yeah, and that uh, speaking of commercial off the shelf, that our final question this afternoon is our business is a COTS distributor and we have our prime customers telling us that we need to be at CMMC level three. How should we respond to that? Yeah, if you are a, a true COTS item distributor um, and that's all you do, um, you should be able to tell your, um, your customer that you sell COTS items only. They're not just commercial, but they're COTS. And um, there's an exception for that. And you should go look at that. Uh, have them go look at that. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that's all the questions we had uh, in queue. Um, so, so just to wrap up this afternoon, Brian, I'd like to thank you again. Uh, great presentation.